Good morning, all. So good to be with you again today. You all get a gold star today for remembering to change your clocks. <laughs> My little dog is waving at me. <laughs> today is the third Sunday in Lent. Great to be back with you. We had a lovely weekend off last weekend with our grandchildren. And thank you so much to Sue and to Julian for looking after the service. I hear it went really well. So that's much appreciated. Um, today, as I said, is the third Sunday in Lent. We're halfway through the season already, and uh, Easter is beckoning off in, in the distance. Today our service is, we're going to follow the blue booklet, and we will begin our service on page four. But before then, announcements. Do we have any announcements from the members of the parish? Elizabeth? Good morning, everyone. So I wanted to remind you, see if I can do this, uh, that we have our plant sale coming up on April 22nd. And uh, there's a sign up sheet in the hall, or not sheet, board, the whiteboard. So if you wouldn't mind when you go for coffee, have a look at the board and see where you might like to volunteer for that. And uh, the things that we're needing if you want to start thinking about bringing our collectibles, we're going to have a regifting and vintage collectibles table. And uh, Leona is going to have a, a, a big bin in the storage room in the hall where you'll be able to place those. And then they'll be given to Jane Fraser to get ready for the, for the sale. And other items, of course, are plants. I hope some of you have started your seeds. I know I have. And um, next time, next Sunday, Catherine will talk to you about the needs for the Muffin Cafe. So that's it. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Elizabeth. So nice to be thinking about plant sales, which reminds us that spring is around the corner. Looking forward to that. So we begin on page four of our blue booklet, if you would please stand. Glory to our Creator, to the Word and the Wisdom, to the Holy One and the Great Spirit, the One who is at the beginning and at the end, and will be with us forever. Amen. In this time and place, we gather on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples and on the traditional territories of the Qualicum and the Nus First Nations, from many places and peoples, we come to this house in prayer. The night has now passed. All of the day lies open before us. Let us greet the beginning of a new week in Christ and acknowledge with thanksgiving the circle of life. As you are comfortable, please would you face east. O risen Christ, the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, in whom all things hold together, we welcome the radiance of your holy presence. Facing south, O risen Christ, in whom we live and move and have our being, we affirm the wonder of creation and the world of humble beings. We welcome your word to reveal hearts of faith, hope, and love. And facing to the west, O risen Christ, through the deepest fear of our hearts, we welcome the freshness of your spirit to awaken us to your sons. And facing north, O risen Christ, we stand as a people of the north and of these western isles. We commit ourselves once again to you and call out our praise to you, our creator and sustainer. Let us face the cross. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of the isles be glad. Let the earth sing out its praise. Rejoice together. Again, I say, rejoice. And in our blue hymn books, hymn number 465, here in this place, new light is streaming. Verses 1, 3, and 4.
a moment of silence, let us hold this moment open to the Divine Spirit. And the collect prayer for this third Sunday in Lent, which is printed in the bulletin, we pray together. Gracious God, you provide us with living water in abundance for all to share. Nourish us with this abundance so that we may be streams of living water to those who thirst for you. Through Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. Amen. And please now be seated for the readings from the Holy Scriptures. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of Sim, the whole congregation of Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses. And they said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on that rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the gathering. As we remain seated, we turn to the insert in our bulletin and sing All Who Thirst for Living Water.
a reflection from the letter to the Christians in Rome. Therefore, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing there where we always well hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us, and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for what God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we are never left feeling shortchanged, quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can, stand under, we can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for. And we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfish sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use to him whatsoever. Now that we are set right with God by means of this sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If, when we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of his son, now that we're at our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by the means of his resurrection life. Now that we have actually received this amazing friendship with God, we are no longer content to simply say it in plodding prose. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus, the Messiah. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the gathering. And our gospel hymn is number 456. He comes to us as one unknown, verses 1, 2, and 5.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the, to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, because you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, hmm, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth anywhere. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming the one who is called Christ, when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She ran back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Many Samaritans from that city came out to see him and believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for now we have heard for ourselves, and we know this is truly the Savior of the world. Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You gonna put a muzzle on the dog? <laughs> <laughs> so for 20 years before I was an Anglican priest, I worked in the corporate world. And the most difficult job I ever had there was back in the early 90s, was when my company sent me to oversee the downsizing of a factory in Southern Ontario. They were going to convert it from a factory to a much smaller warehouse. Well, for the first year, we tried to find new work for the factory to try and save the jobs. 
but we were unsuccessful, so we had to go ahead with the downsizing. Making sure to do it with compassion and generosity it was a big company with deep pockets, and so they could afford that. We designed a smaller organization for the plant. We decided who was to stay and who had to be laid off. And then we met with each person on one day to tell them the outcome for their job. One of those to be let go was a man named Mitch. Well, that's not his real name. Mitch was a middle-aged forklift driver. He was a Newfoundlander, loud, blunt, hilariously funny, always dressed in greasy overalls, long shaggy hair and unshaven. I was really nervous about him, not knowing how he was going to react to the news that he was losing his job. And also I was pessimistic about his chances of finding another job, given his, well, his age and his general demeanor. So when he came into the room to meet with us, he handed me a piece of paper and said, Alan, you need to read this. And I thought, oh no, it's a lawyer's letter or a threat or something. But he insisted I read it. So I said, OK, I'll read it. And to my surprise, it was the so-called serenity prayer. You may know it. I'm sure you do. God, give me the grace to accept with serenity the things I cannot change. Give me courage to change the things I can change and wisdom to know the difference. He saw I was surprised and said, my daughter gave it to me at breakfast this morning, and I thought you might like to see that prayer on a day like today. I then had to give him the bad news, told him what his severance package would be, and then he left with a counselor who we had hired to help him and all of the others. So as time went by, we tried to keep in touch with those who lost their jobs. Many of them did just fine, some not so good. And then there was Mitch, who astounded me. He did everything the counselors told him to do. He signed up for every training course that was offered, computer skills, financial management, how to write a resume, he did them all. He also got a makeover. He came to see us a couple of months later, and I hardly recognized him. Clean shaven, hair neatly cut, dressed in slacks and a sweater, and beaming from ear to ear. He had landed a new job down the road with more responsibility, and it paid $1.50 an hour more. I said to him, I guess God honored that prayer you showed me. And I'll always remember what he said to me. He said, Alan, I often wondered what it would be like if I could make a fresh start and I got the chance to do that. A makeover and a fresh start. That's a great thought for Lent. The last few weeks, our gospel readings have been about folk in the Bible who made a fresh start, although theirs had less to do with their career direction and more to do with the rest of their life. We heard the story of Abram and Sarah in the Old Testament book of Genesis, who you remember up to their tents and, and moved after their encounter with God. And then in John's Gospel, there was Nicodemus, the curious Pharisee, who was just gobsmacked at the idea he could start a new life, born from above, as the text put it. And today it was this Samaritan woman who encountered Jesus at a well at midday. And the story starts oddly. What was a Jewish teacher, a rabbi, Jesus, doing in Samaria, a neighboring territory hostile to the Jewish nation? And what was a woman doing at the well on her own in the heat of the midday sun? This was desert country. Most everyone came at daybreak or evening when it was cooler. And why was that rabbi, Jesus, speaking to a strange woman on their own at a well? That was the village's social meeting point. Today, it would look a bit like going to a singles bar to find a companion. Well, 
As the story unfolds, we learn that this woman had been shunned by her community because she had, shall we say, a reputation. So she sneaked out to the well to get water at noon to avoid meeting anyone, just as Jesus stopped by for a drink of water. But the oddest part of the story is that after Jesus spoke to her, she ran back into town to tell everyone about what had happened. And they listened to her. Usually backs were turned when she appeared. But this time it was different. She had been dead to them, buried under a load of shame, which they had heaped on her. But that day, her eyes were sparkling and she seemed to be alive again as she begged them, come and see this guy who told me everything I've ever done. Do you think he could be the promised one, the Christ? And so almost without thinking, all of the townsfolk found themselves running to the well at the, in the middle of the day to see for themselves what had, what had given this woman her amazing new lease on life, her makeover, her new start. So what was it that drew everyone to Jesus? What was it that transformed this woman and her community and brought them together, reconciled them all again? Well, the best way to explain it is in the words that St. Paul used in the other New Testament reading from the letter to the Romans. If while we were enemies with each other, we were reconciled to God, then having been reconciled to God, how much more are we reconciled with each other? And that's the blinding revelation that came to them. She and Jesus, by every human measure, were enemies, ethnically, religiously, socially. He knew her situation and could have treated her with the same contempt as everyone else. But he showed them a different way a way that saves people from the suffering that they cause each other as the world around them is divided into friends and enemies. Jesus showed them, and of course us, how to love those we dislike until we don't dislike them anymore. The townsfolk had looked at this woman and they saw sin. Jesus looked at this woman and he saw suffering. He saw a kind of a spiritual death in her, but also a thirst. And his love, what he called living water, brought her to life again. It was as if that stagnant water in the well had become a fountain of spring water bubbling inside her. An absolute makeover and a fresh start, which spread from her to her community. For me, the point is, we need to be aware of whether our faith and whether our religious practices, whether they draw us closer together to others or whether they separate us. As I get older, I, I more and more tell myself, it's one thing to have faith and talk about faith, but the bigger question is how one's faith affects others. You know, I'm honestly less interested in what people believe and much more interested in how whatever they believe is displayed in their life. And so today we might bring that story of the Samaritan woman closer to home. We might think about the impact of our faith and our practices on others. What in them needs a makeover? What's become stagnant or strained? Is there a broken relationship to be fixed, for example? Or a makeover in a particular attitude? Or is there a need to drop a habit which is limiting quality of life? Or maybe we need to hit the reset button on a daily routine of meditation and prayer. Steps like that taken in faith lead us into a new dispensation for ourselves and those around us. As I said earlier, we're almost halfway through Lent, which is a journey to a date. It's a date with the cross, 
a Good Friday and an Easter makeover. A fresh start, no matter our age or life experience or our situation. In our celebration of Christ's death and resurrection just four weeks away, we will once again be invited to enter it as a kind of a door, a doorway to being made right with God and with each other, so that in God's grace, we may indeed enjoy our own fresh start and makeover, which will make us feel like there's a fresh stream of water bubbling up from within. Amen. Page seven in our blue service book, halfway down the page, let us together affirm our faith. We give our hearts in trust to God, whose love is the source of our life and the desire of our lives. We give our hearts in trust to Jesus, who came to bring us healing and to liberate us from all forms of oppression. We give our hearts in trust to the Spirit of God, who transforms and transfigures our world, and who works in and through all who are turned towards the truth. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and sometimes full of doubt, we affirm our trust in the community of faith and in the name of Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves to the service of all people to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness. Amen. <coughs> Let us quieten our hearts now for prayer. Lord, make us conscious of your presence in our midst and help us to know that your love is all around us. Lord God, with Lent, we approach the springtime of the year when the face of the earth is renewed and life emerges out of death. We pray that this season of Lent may also be a springtime for our souls that our lives may be renewed by the Spirit and warmed by the sunshine of your love in order that we may better serve you through serving others. God of love and compassion, Hear our prayer. we give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for our many blessings and for enjoyment of life here in the beauty and peace of Oceanside. We are grateful for the blessings of health, the comforts of home and family life and the joy of friendship. God of love and compassion. Yeah. We give you thanks for our church family, for each member of the parish of St. Anne and St. Edmunds, for Andrew and Sandy, for Alan and Diana, for Holly and Jada, for our Bishop Anna, and for Ron and Christina, God of love and compassion. Yeah. Loving Father, we pray for all who are in need, for those who are sick, for the grieving, for the anxious and afraid, 
for those who are lonely, for addicts, for the homeless, for migrants, for refugees and the disenfranchised. We pray that they all may be given courage, patience and peace of heart and that we, your people, will provide relief in their suffering. God of love and compassion. God of mercy, we pray for peace in our troubled world. We hold up to you the people of the Ukraine, Russia, Afghanistan, Israel and Palestine, whose lives are fearful and uncertain. God of love and compassion. Lord of compassion, be with those who live in countries that have experienced loss of life and property caused by tropical storms, tornadoes, floods, mudslides, avalanches, earthquakes and fires. Give comfort to the suffering and support to those who are bringing relief and trying to restore order. God of love and compassion. Heavenly Father, graciously receive these our prayers and answer them as best for us, as may be best for us, and for those for whom we have prayed. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm turning to page 12 in our blue booklet. Source of love and compassion, we confess to you our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives, our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our participation in the exploitation of others, our anger at our own frustration, and our envy of those who seem to have more. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts, and our share of dishonesty in daily life and work, our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to commend the faith that is in us, our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty our false judgments and uncharitable thoughts towards others, and our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us, our waste and pollution of the world around us, and our lack of concern for those coming after us. Accept our truthful confession and our commitment to change our ways. Strengthen our weakness and renew our lives. We have the assurance that God cancels our debts, releases us from things we have wrongly held, and unites what we have falsely separated. Therefore, we have the strength to face our weaknesses as those who are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, friends, Christ breaks down the barrier between friend and stranger, young and old, male and female, to bind us together as one in a community of reconciliation. The peace of God is always with you. you. Please take a moment to greet those around you. Our offertory hymn is number 450, You Call Us Lord to Be.
we turn to the bottom of page 13 in the blue booklet, as we present these gifts of money and these names of people who are in our prayers, let us pray together. God of grace and glory, receive our offerings of praise and thanksgiving. Strengthen us for the perfect freedom of your service, so that all our lives may be a true and living sacrifice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The glory of God covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. The trees of the field clap their hands. The birds of the headlands call out their praise. We join with the song of creation and proclaim the glory of God. Holy and eternal one, in whom we live and move and have our being, our origin and our fulfillment, we praise and thank you for drawing us to this sacred meal. From the ocean of your primal love, you fashioned the marvel of creation and the beauty of human life. From this land of towering forests, mist-laden coastlines, the rhythms of the tidal seas, storm and stillness, you humble us to affirm the sacred gift of all creation and our stewardship for everything given and received. Glory to you, the source of all life. From the earliest days, the peoples of these islands learned their dependence on your provision. With salmon and whale, elk and bear, through song and ceremony, dance and painted cedar, they hallowed these sacred relationships with all life. Glory to you, the source of all life. In Jesus Christ, you came into our world to reveal your glory, to reconcile all peoples to yourself and make all things new in him. Now gathered from many places in faith that is known to you alone and with a heart set on the pilgrim way, we bring this bread and wine, yearning for the nourishment of your spirit and the fullness you promise in Jesus. Glory to you, source of all life. Joining then with the saints of every time and place from these islands shaped by the surging tides, wind and salt, we raise our thankful voices as we proclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, most holy one in Jesus, who on that night before he died took bread and gave you thanks. Jesus broke the bread, gave it to all gathered, and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup, gave you thanks, and gave the cup to the disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Therefore, God, of all creation, we lift this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Send your Holy Spirit on these gifts and upon us, that we may know Jesus in the breaking of the bread and follow him in lives of selfless service and courageous love. Glory to you, the source of all life. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and bring us to that heavenly table where we will feast anew and every tear will be wiped away. Blessing and thanksgiving be to you, O Holy and Eternal One, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Glory to you, source of all life. Hallelujah. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray together.
and over on page 18, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We be many of one body, but we will all share in one bread. And these, my friends, are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, as we have been blessed in the bread and the wine shared as a church family, may we now go out and be a blessing to those around us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Clock of page 19. Would you stand as you are able? Glory to God, whose power working in us can be infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And now the
peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you. Be with each one that you love. And be with each one that you are praying for today and always. Amen. Amen. And our closing hymn, number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory.